Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So today I want to go through Phil Town's Rule One Fund Annual Report. Uh, it just came out on March 11th, 2021, so four days ago. Uh, and there's some good stuff in there. So let's take a look at it. Um, first, I want to fix this on top, float on top. Now we're going to go to sec.gov, okay? And we're going to click this company filings to find this report. It's a little tricky to find. That's why I'm taking you guys through this process. So the Rule 1 fund is filed under an umbrella company called World Funds Trust. So we're going to click through to that. We're going to scroll down and we're going to click on kind of this last NCSR file. Okay. Uh, I only know that because I looked through these. Um, so you're just going to have to open each one and see which ones apply to the Rule 1 fund. So we're going to open that. And you can see here, uh, down at the bottom, index Rule 1 fund. Okay. So this is the one we want. Um, and you can see here, R-U-L-R-X, Annual Report, the Rule 1 Fund Annual Report. Now, this is interesting. It's for the period April 1st, 2020 to December 31st, 2020. So it says Annual Report, but it's really just covering three quarters. And I think the reason for that, Rule 1 Fund, they changed kind of when their year end is for whatever reason, um, not too long ago. So let's dive into the actual letter. I'm going to try to blow this up a little bit for you guys. Um, you can see it was written on February 5th, so a little more than a month ago. To the shareholders of the Rule 1 Fund, we had a good 2020. I'm happy to report that for the year ended December 31st, 2020, our first full calendar year, the fund gained 12% after fees and expenses. According to an analysis by Broadridge Financial Solutions, the fund placed in the top 9% of the 73 funds in Morningstar category, you know, whatever category Rule 1 is in, this multi-alternative, and number two in our peer group, as identified by Broadridge. In addition, the fund substantially outperformed the peer group median return of 4.66% and a category median return of 3.55%. Now, I'm a little bit confused about, you know, why Phil Town is comparing this fund to these other funds. I mean, you go back to his first book, Rule One Investing, he just tears funds apart, okay? So, you know, I, I don't see much merit in comparing this fund to other funds. Clearly, these funds are underperforming. Uh, largely because of the high fees that they charge um, and because it, it's been kind of different recently in terms of how much outperformance there have been by kind of the tech giants, the leaders of the S&P 500. Um, so that's that's a little strange. Um, uh, this year, the excess cash in the fund that muffled our returns in 2019 did its job by lowering risk when the pandemic shutdown crashed the Dow in March 2020. Now, I'm not exactly sure what he means by lowering risk, okay, by having a lot of cash in the portfolio. Um, to me, risk is really just risk of losing money, which happens not because the prices are fluctuating, but because you know, you sell at the wrong time or you just invested in the wrong companies that get beaten down when there's when there's a crash uh, and, and aren't able to kind of pop back. So I'm not sure what what exactly he means by lowering risk. It also provided the liquidity to buy a few businesses from our wish list that brief, briefly went on sale. Now, that makes a ton of sense. That's a great reason to have cash in the portfolio is to buy businesses when they get down to that target buy price. Uh, we definitely had our wash tub ready. This is what Buffett says about putting out buckets when it's raining gold rather than a thimble. Um, but the decision by the Federal Reserve to print money and by the President and Congress to quickly distribute it to desperate people and businesses, a decision we applauded, 
right, that, that needed to happen, uh, resulted in the market recovering as suddenly as it crashed. I didn't see that quick recovery coming, and I watched in astonishment as the Dow and stocks of our desire that hadn't yet gone on sale soared off into the blue sky yonder. While we fell short of fully loading up our portfolio in March, we didn't completely miss out. We bought several of our favorites on sale and the soaring market benefited all of our positions this year, even with a substantial amount of the fund still in cash to hedge volatility. And we're gonna talk about two examples that Phil Town uh, goes into in this annual report um, that, that, that they bought uh, during this March uh, dip. Um, in the fund annual letter dated May 11th, 2020, uh, which was the initial fiscal year, Phil wrote, over the next 18 months, I think it likely that the market highs will get lower and the lows will get lower because in, until it becomes clear that it will not rebound anytime soon and then everyone who really needs their money anytime soon will get out and the market will find a bottom. That's a very concise way to describe kind of how a market bottom forms. Uh, I was impressed with that. Uh, as of this writing, the Dow is only up single digits from last January, but the impact of the pandemic, civic disturbances in the summer and fall, massive money printing, and the ongoing payments of trillions of dollars directly to pandemic-impacted small business and individuals has altered my view of where the market may be going in the short run. So, okay, Phil has kind of a short-term macro uh, idea in his mind here, uh, which Monish Pabrai doesn't tend to uh, spend time on that kind of an outlook, which is interesting to compare that. Uh, these policies may have the effect of driving the market up higher and for longer than I thought. Uh, last May. So he had thoughts last May. His thinking has shifted since then due to these factors that we've seen kind of unfold in the last year. Um, so he talks about how the Rule One Fund invests. You know, they they don't chase uh, things that are that are going up like a rocket. Uh, effectively, is what he's saying there. Uh, we invest money our investors can't afford to lose, including you know our money that we can't afford to lose, and we will continue to focus on buying companies that we believe will not lose money, rather than stocks that are soaring in a hot market. You know I think that's very sound uh, investing that that philosophy. Uh, we call companies of this of the sort we want to own anti-fragile from. Nicholas Nassim Taleb's book, Anti-Fragile, Things That Gain From Disorder. A thing is anti-fragile if it benefits from shocks. A company is anti-fragile if it will benefit from shocks to the economy. Uh, Taleb writes, I'd rather be dumb and anti-fragile than extremely smart and fragile anytime. This echoes Buffett's quip that I try to invest in businesses that are so wonderful that an idiot can run them because sooner or later one will. Um, you know, I think of anti-fragile businesses, Costco comes to mind, Amazon comes to mind, companies that have really benefited from this last year, uh, gotten quite a bit stronger. Here is what a wonderful anti-fragile company looks like to us. One, simple and predictable. Uh, two, durable competitive advantage, uh, you know, a strong moat. Three, high free cash flow. Four, low debt. Five, high return on invested capital. And finally, number six, a CEO that has integrity and talent. Um, you know, a lot of things Buffett and Munger have said over the years. And it also reminds me of, you know, what Bill Ackman really looks for in an investment. These are some of the things he'd rip off in terms of you know, what he's looking for. Uh, here's a good example of what we're looking for. So he talks about Boeing here. What is the investment case for Boeing? We bought Boeing after the shock to the company from the grounding of the 737 MAX. They fired the CEO and the mess created by previous management in one of the most iconic companies in the world 
certainly brings to mind Buffett's quip. Uh, you know, Buffett talking about how an idiot will run every business. So you, you need to buy businesses that can withstand that. Uh, we thought that the business was plenty wonderful enough to survive previous management. Then came the pandemic. Sorry, guys, just have to reset this here. Then came the pandemic. Ooh, what's going to happen? Um, and the shutdown of the airlines. And suddenly low debt became huge debt, about $50 billion. But Boeing still had 737 MAX orders worth over $350 billion and still had the durable competitive advantage of the worldwide duopoly for the construction of passenger aircraft. And we believe Boeing's new management team would build a bigger and more productive business in 10 years. You know, that's really uh, what Phil Town is looking for. Is the business going to be better 10 years from now than it is today? So here's the investment thesis, effectively. As the price of Boeing stock dropped towards $100, we noticed that Boeing was just was one of just a couple trusted defense contractors for military aircraft, and that the cash flow from that part of the business was thriving and worth almost $100 per share. We could buy an anti-fragile defense company and get the commercial aircraft business nearly for free. Uh, we bought more, and now Boeing is one of the larger positions in the fund. Uh, in this, our first calendar year with a portfolio of what we think are anti-fragile companies, the fund outperformed our benchmark, the Dow, 12% to 9.7%, and did so during the market collapse in March with half the volatility of the Dow. When the Dow dropped 35%, the fund only dropped 17%. So we need to talk about this, okay? Uh, I'm going to scroll down a little bit here. So I'm not sure what to make of this, but the numbers that Phil Town is using here uh, are right here, okay? Rule one fund versus the Dow Jones, one year ended 12-31-2020. Now this is actually the only period in these three periods where the Rule 1 fund outperformed either of these indices, okay, the Dow Jones or the S&P 500. So, you know, is this cherry picking? I, I'm a little concerned that it might be cherry picking. Uh, but to be honest, I don't really care how the fund has performed over the last year. Um, I think it's probably going to do very well over 5, 10, 20 years. But I don't like this. This feels like cherry picking, where the only outperformance in any of these periods where results are being measured is the one that's being used. So, uh, I mean, you can see what the S&P 500 has done over these periods. 47% uh, in that last three quarters of 2020, 18% in the full year 2020, and 24% since the fund inception back in June of 2019. So I don't love it. Um, but you can see Phil Town is trying to make a point here about, you know, outperforming the, uh, the benchmark with half the volatility of the benchmark. Uh, he wouldn't have been able to made that point if there weren't kind of this this one data point where where that was true. So, eh, not again, not crazy about it. Well, as you can see there the uh the rule 1 fund versus the Dow over that period, um which is what right the the whole year 2020. A fund that produces higher returns than the Dow is not supposed to do so with lower volatility at least not in academia. So now we get into the efficient market hypothesis and how, you know, supposedly this is an example how that does not hold up. Uh, we're, we're just going to kind of skip over that. But we get into Seritage growth properties here. Let's, let's look at this one a bit. Seritage is redeveloping empty Sears stores. Buffett bought 5% of Seritage uh, at $35 per share. 
and Berkshire is financing the construction. So this was back in 2015 when Seritage spun off from Sears. Uh, in February 2020, Seritage was selling for $38 per share, okay? close to where Buffett bought five years prior. Um, in March, the price dropped to $7, so 38 to 7 uh, if we want to buy it, is it more or less risky for us to buy at 7 in March than in $38 in February? We believe the 80% drop in the stock price made the business more attractive, not less, because it provided us with a larger margin of safety. So we bought it. With the market soaring and, and the end of the pandemic in sight, SRG stock ended the year at $14, okay? So crash down to seven, bounce back to 14. When we get it right, the market often quickly corrects the mispricing and the stock price goes up. When we get it wrong, we know that buying with a larger margin of safety leaves us in a much better position than buying without one. So this is kind of the heads I win, tails I don't lose much concept that Pabrai talks about a lot. Well, let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, is it more or less risky for us to buy at seven versus 38? Clearly, there was a very different kind of economic picture in March than there was in February. So to me, it's not a given that just because it drops 80% uh, means it's necessarily a better investment. You have to take kind of the whole picture of the business into account. Uh, but I certainly agree that Seritage was much more compelling at seven than it was at 38. Uh, but you, you really have to understand the business in order to know that. So I think, you know, just as you gotta know more uh, than kind of what's being, what's being said here. Uh, but to be fair, the 80% drop in stock price made the business more attractive to us, okay? Not less. So, so he's not necessarily speaking generally uh, which which is good because that's not a general principle you want to apply to businesses that drop 80%. They're not necessarily uh, compelling investments after that happens. Uh, I also want to note, Phil Town sold off the, his entire Seritage position in the Rule 1 fund, probably around 14. I uh, just want to mention now it's at around $22 per share, Okay. So instead of capturing that double, could have been a triple. Um, and I'm still a little confused as to why Phil Town sold at $14. You know, he mentioned management changing, but I don't know. There's something a little fishy to me uh, going on there. I'm not, not, yeah, I don't feel like he's fully explained why, why he sold that, which he doesn't have to, right? That's not uh, something that he's obligated to do, but I'm, I'm curious about it. Um, and this I don't really understand either. This seems hardly open to debate, yet there is an academic argument that the company was safer to buy at 38. They believe in the efficient market theory that says SRG must be riskier at the lower price. Um, okay, that, that makes some sense to me. Uh, obviously, pretty much anybody who... Anyone who's watching my videos knows the efficient market theory is, you know, suspect, uh, you know, to be conservative. Hogwash uh, is, is more how I would describe it. I mean, the markets are mostly efficient, right? But to say that they're always efficient is, is obviously silly. Um, okay, let's get into this piece here. Um, our tactics to achieve our goals define us for the purposes of comparison to other mutual funds as a focused, deep value, contrarian, event-driven, macro-technical momentum, volatility, and derivative trading fund. So the rest of this uh, annual report is Phil Town getting, getting into what do each of these terms mean? Uh, and I think it's it's worthwhile to 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 look at some of these. Uh, getting out of the market and into cash at just the right time is called timing the market, right? Market timing. 
and everyone knows it can't be done over the long run. I didn't know everyone knew that, but apparently everyone knows that. Uh, I believe that as well, just for the record. There are, they are right, can't be done over the long run. But we don't have to time the market to find ourselves substantially in cash at roughly the right time. Now, this is a really important point for you know anyone who's thinking about holding cash, thinking, all right, markets are very frothy. Uh, this, this is good. Um, this is not magic. It's just a rational process that starts with a list of businesses we want to buy. When the market is going up and up, it becomes more and more difficult to buy at a deep discount to value. So naturally, the cash we have on hand sits in a government bond fund, waiting for an opportunity to be committed to purchase a business. In addition, as the price of the business we own soar irrationally far above what we believe to be their value, we may sell and add to the cash pile, okay? Liquidate the position. This willingness to stay in cash and or sell when everyone is buying is why we consider the fund to be a contrarian fund, okay? This is value investing 101, okay? Um, now, yeah, it, it makes total sense, right? If the whole market is rising in price, uh, a list of businesses that we wanna buy are also typically going to be rising with the market. So we're not necessarily timing the market per se, by having more and more cash in the portfolio, uh, it's just harder and harder to find investments that meet our criteria uh, that we can buy with a margin of safety. So I like how he explained that. The flip side of this coin happens when there is a big event, typically some unexpected problem with the economy. In 2008, it was a freeze of credit caused by collapsing mortgage bonds. In 2011, it was a panic over sovereign bonds in Europe. Last March, of course, it was the pandemic. Events that result in market drops happen with such regularity that Ben Graham, Buffett's mentor and the father of Rule One strategy, considered these shocks to be the normal fluctuations of the market. These fluctuations create major price moves in the market and these moves create opportunity, okay? Wall Street calls funds that invest when shocks happen event driven. Uh, the funds that invest as the market moves quickly down or up are categorized as investing on volatility. When events and volatility occur together, they set the stage for the fund to possibly become an aggressive buyer. So, right, this is really Mr. Market, right? Mr. Market gets euphoric, Mr. Market gets uh, depressed. There's much wider swings in market prices than they are swings in value of the underlying business that those uh, stocks represent, that the, 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 the stocks that are being priced by the market. So, you know, that's also value investing 101. When a major event like the pandemic shuts down part of the economy, there is significant downward volatility in the stock market, which basically means there's a crash. Uh, that is when we expect to see at least a few companies we want to buy, companies on the wish list, uh, get priced at a deep discount of 50% or more below what we believe to be their value. When this happened in March, to Seritage and several other companies on our buy list, we shook off our sloth and became aggressive buyers, and we loaded up on the select few companies that went on sale. Uh, even so, we didn't get to buy every target business we wanted because many of them did not go on sale in March. Waiting to buy until the price is extremely low compared to what we believe to be the real value of the business is a discipline of rule one that Wall Street calls deep value, okay? Makes sense. When we buy, we only want to buy businesses we understand. Getting to that level of comfort with a business requires a significant amount of study, and that cannot be delegated. Therefore, being human with only 24 hours in a day, we must limit the number of businesses the fund owns. This is very important stuff here. This is kind of justification for concentration in the portfolio uh, as a stock picker, right? Uh, we must, right, we, we believe something in the range of around 15 businesses is about right. So 
as of the end of 2020, the Rule One Fund owned nine businesses. Okay, so Phil is saying we really want to own around 15 businesses, uh, which would be around seven percent in each one at cost. If assuming those are equal weighted, right? I think Phil, Phil doesn't really. I don't think we're ever going to see an equal weighting of 15 different companies in the Rule One Fund, because uh, there's companies that Phil has a lot higher conviction on. So it's going to be, you know, more concentrated in the top five positions or so. Our industry calls that small number of stocks a focused portfolio. But we believe 15 businesses well chosen can be shown to have virtually the same diversification as the 30 businesses in the Dow, the gold standard market index for over 120 years. Indeed, as Buffett says, if risk comes from not knowing what we're buying, then we think keeping the portfolio focused on a limited number of businesses we can understand well makes the fund less risky than funds that are over diversified. In March 2020, we bought a small number of stocks aggressively. Wall Street calls this aspect focused. Um, you know, Charlie Munger would go even further than this and say, if you own five businesses that you really understand, that's enough as far as diversification goes. Um, and Pabrai would add, if you're managing other people's money, maybe 10. Um, so those are two rules of thumbs from some of Phil Town's kind of mentors, Charlie Munger and Monish Pabrai. There are times, however, when we believe the market is not overpricing companies we own and nothing we want to buy is on sale. In fact, that is more often the case than not. We adopted option trading strategies for these in-between times to increase our cash flow using proprietary macro and technical signals. These rule one strategies for cash flow are called macro technical and derivative trading by Wall Street. So. You know, nothing, nothing is in the buy zone. Nothing is so expensive that it's worth selling. This is how, you know, the Rule One Fund makes a little cash, generates some cash, is through these options trading strategies. Um, Warren Buffett said the stock market can be characterized by two emotions, greed and fear. And the secret of lower risk, higher returns is to sell the greed and buy the fear. And that is really what all these tactics and mutual fund definitions boil down to. Selling the greed, buying the fear, being a contrarian. Uh, we believe this strategy has been deployed over the last 90 years with success through periods of massive dollar devaluation, war, depression, recession, inflation, irrational exuberance, deflation, stagflation, low interest rates, high interest rates, and pandemic, and we believe it has succeeded in delivering higher returns with lower risk than any other strategy of investing. It's the all-weather approach, okay? This year, we experienced a taste of what rule one, rule one strategy can do to lower the fund's risk when extreme market volatility occurs. Okay, last paragraph, guys. We're almost there. In addition, a number of the businesses we own that have seen substantial increases in their market price this year are still priced significantly below our estimate of their intrinsic value. Hmm, wonder which ones those are. Well, you can look at what options, you know, are, have been sold by Phil Town recently to get a sense for what that target buy price is, what companies... Um, Phil is still interested in. Um, or even better, we could see what was bought in the last quarter. And, you know, I made a video on this recently, what the range of prices were uh, to get a, an estimate of what price Phil Town really likes those companies. Uh, we still have a lot of cash, a big wash tub ready to catch more of whatever buying opportunities rain down on us in the next inevitable economic storm. We will continue to do our best for your family and ours in this very pricey market with a continued focus, as always, on rule number one. So there you have it, guys. Phil Town, he's still got a lot of cash. He's less pessimistic, it seems, in the short term because of all of the factors that were previously mentioned. 
uh, the willingness of the Fed to print, print, print to keep us from heading down a, a dark road. Um, but, you know, that printing, printing, printing could lead us down another dark road. Not, not as soon as perhaps if we weren't willing to print, print, print. But, you know, there's a lot of concern uh, in terms of you know, not the short, short term, but the medium term of what's going to happen with the U.S. dollar. You know, are we going to maintain our status as the global reserve currency? What's going to happen with inflation? Are we going to have hyperinflation? There's a lot of uncertainty uh, in the in the medium term. So um, anyway, guys, just wanted to kind of plow through that rule one fund annual report. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't really picking on Phil with, you know, the comparison to other mutual funds and um, comparing to the Dow for this one period that, that the Rule 1 fund overperformed. Not picking on him. I just want to point out, um, you could really tell any story you want to tell by being selective about what data you use to tell that story. So make sure, I mean, when you guys are reading annual reports from investors, when you guys are trying to assess um, different companies, make sure you know what's behind the numbers and make sure you see the big picture rather than just letting whoever's writing that report pull a couple data points uh, that kind of frame the story that they want to tell. You know, we need to be, we need to go a little bit deeper than that to make intelligent decisions. So anyway, guys, just wanted to share that. I hope, hope this was valuable to you. Uh, and with that, I will see you all in the next video. Take care.